God, it's so stupid. I don't know why I'm studying. I'm just gonna fail it. So. When are we ever gonna use this? So what do all these kids have in common? What all these students have in common is they have a math learning disability. What does it mean for these students to have a math learning disability? Some of them might be great students in other classes, but they just have a, a unique struggle in math. In particular, students suffering from unexpected learning problems after a classroom teacher or other trained professionals were provided math interventions for a sustained period of time. Okay? Oftentimes, these students, as you guys can see in these videos, they're very frustrated and they almost think they're failures. They think they're not very good at math. Um, their, their struggles mostly come from a deficit or delay in their processing of numbers, arithmetic learning procedures, and the structure of basic mathematic computations. Um, these mathematical difficult, difficulties appear to be persistent and evident across elementary through their secondary levels. Some students may see success at the elementary level but don't see success at the middle school level. They all uh, have a learning disability from a social worker, social worker in the school and um, so they, did, they have gotten tested, or a psychologist I should say, and they have been tested and they get qualified for a math learning disability. The research shows that roughly five to eight percent of the children are diagnosed with a math learning disability and I went through the data at our school and this holds true in our school too it actually comes out to 7.5 percent in our school there's 128 students that had a learning disability in our school at Grand Ledge Public Schools and um, we have roughly 1700 students so if you do the math on that it's about seven and a half of our high school population has a math learning disability um, I work, I have the pleasure of working with almost all of these students as I'm the only resource math teacher at the high school. Um, of these students, 84 are qualified for both math problem solving and calculation. 26 of our students have just math calculation and 18 of them have just problem solving. And uh, so that makes up our high school population as far as math learning disabilities go. We branch these off into math population or math problem solving and math calculation. So students may have both or one or the other. Basically, math calculation is a disability that affects the learner's ability to perform basic mathematical operations. Um, they have persistent, tr persistent trouble knowing basic number facts. These are the students that you'll see oftentimes counting with their hand because they don't know how to do basic math computations. Um, they, they oftentimes, you'll see them have pencil marks or some type of um, erase marks from, from their mathematical computations. Um, they just can't do what the average person can do. Um, as far as math problem solving goes, it's usually a, a disability with the student in which applied math skills and they have a problem doing specific math problems in a related story problem or real life facts or a real world story problem. You may see these students be able to solve problems in basic forms. Like we said, not always do they have math calculation and problem solving. They might just qualify one or the other. But they may have severe problems on doing these story problems, which is why they classify under math problem solving. Um, what is the process for student qualifying? Um, in math problem solving, there is a process. Um, there is an RTI approach. Um, we start with tier one. This is basically all the students wrapped up in one. It puts an emphasis that the student may be experiencing problems. So this is like our first sign that a student may have a learning disability in math or problems with math. Um, if they continue to struggle, we'll put them in tier two. This is a, a different type of instruction. They'll probably have answers shortened up. Um, they'll have differentiated instruction given to them to see if the student can be successful to meet the learning needs. Um, tier three is like our obviously our biggest or the last approach in the process. This in, this requires more individualized instruction for the stu students. Again, the goal to the response to intervention model. The goal for this is to reduce the number of students in successive tiers 
and the number of students who receive um, resource instruction or are placed as a math learning disability. We try to limit that at all costs. So the first step I want to talk about is uh, they're all research-based practices and this, these are some of the approaches that I use in my classroom and I will demonstrate them after um, each slide. So again, these are research-based practices that have proven to work with kids who do have learning disabilities. The first process is to teach students using explicit instruction. Um, some of you may ask, what is an explicit instruction? Explicit instruction is to have a clear approach in getting the solution. It focuses on a step-by-step, -step, a very organized approach for the, for the students to complete. We present multiple examples, and we provide immediate feedback to the students. And these are some of the qualities for explicit instruction. First thing we're going to do is we want to graph our scatter plot. So we're going to follow these steps on how we're going to graph the scatter plot. So the first step in the process is hit the stat button. So can you hit the stat button for me? Good. So then we're going to hit enter on the edit. And we're going to, what we're going to do now is we're going to edit our chart. So we're going to plug all the numbers in from our chart, from our piece of paper. This is going to allow us to graph a scatter plot. So we want to hit now hit step two. So we already highlighted all the information and plugged our chart in. So now the last thing we want to do is hit graph. And now we can see that we have our data in the graph. By doing this, we can now find a line of best fit. So we're going to find a line that goes through or as close to all those points as possible. And we're going to talk about how they're related to each other. So the next step in the process is to hit stat. And then we're going to go over to Calc, so we're going to push the arrow button. And then we're going to go down all the way to number 4. And then linear regression is our line of best fit. That's our equation that we're going to use. So we're going to hit Enter. And then we're going to go down to Calculate. And we're going to hit Enter again. And now it's going to give us all our data. And as you can see there, we have our equation in our calculator and now we can find that line of best fit by following the last step of the process which is hit y equals and then we're going to type that equation in so 1.02x plus 2.02 and then we're going to hit graph and now we see that is the line of best fit. Okay. So by following all these steps, does this help you out a little bit more? Good. Uh, the second step, um, research-based practices that you can use for a student in a resource program, um, is teach the student using multiple instructional examples. Um, you'll see in the skit today that I use a strategy where we start off from the easiest component of the lesson and we advance stages um, to the hardest examples. Uh, a lot of times when we're going through notes using this, this approach, you'll see when I use notes, I, uh, I do the I do, you do, we do. So I do a problem for the students, then they do it on their own, and then we do the last, we'll, we'll correct that problem that they did on their own so that they are all on the same page. Uh, this is an example of an, instruct, an instructional example. Um, we select wide range of multiple examples of a specific type of problem. We select a pattern from complex to concrete. And there's a sequence from most important to the student mastery of the topic. All right, we're going to be solving equations today. And in solving equations, we're going to have a few examples. Okay? And they range from, from mastery, too. It's, we usually start with the beginning problems, and we end with the more difficult problem. Um, for some reason, kids have a more of a difficulty um, using fractions. So we're going to start out um, somewhat with an easier problem and work our way to a more challenging problem by using a few examples. The more examples we do, the more the kids and the students are going to catch on to uh, being able to solve our variable, solve for x in this case. So in example one, we're going to get the variable by itself. I tell the kids what's preventing us from having x by itself. And the kids will be able to tell me that the 3 is preventing us from having the x by itself. So we're going to get rid of it. And we're going to bring it to the other side. So 2x equals 12. And if we divide by 2, we find that x is 6. 
very basic problem. Students will catch on with this very quickly, but then we're going to arrange, we're going to check their mastery of the material, and we're going to try a fraction problem, which is definitely a little bit more challenging. But we're going to tell the kids that the process doesn't change. What's preventing us from having x by itself is the 2. So we're going to get rid of the 2 by doing the opposite. And 4 minus 2 is 2, so we have 1 half x equals 2. This is where it gets a little bit tough, because there's a division problem here, so we want to multiply by the reciprocal. The reciprocal of 1 half is 2 over 1. That gets us our x by itself. And what we do to one side, we got to do to the other. So I'm multiplying by 2 over 1 on the other side as well. And 2 times 2 gets us 4. Same type of problem, teaching the same process, but just a different result and a little bit more challenging as we move on. The third step in our research-based approach on how to help students that have a math learning disability would be have the student verbalize their solutions to a math problem or a big idea. I tend to use this a lot with our kids. I, I oftentimes, you'll hear me or you'll hear me in my classroom say, um, I'll call on a specific student and I'll say, please tell me what this means in words. Tell me what this means to you. Verbalize what this means to you in words. Um, this creates kind of like a summary for the student. They have to summarize the information that we've been going over and express in their ideas what the big ideas are. If they're not correct, if I don't think those are the right ideas, I kind of help them through it, and that way they're taught or know the big ideas um, that we're learning in the program. Um, so you'll see student verbalizations. This is a big scaffolding idea. Um, this is kind of used in any subject summarizing what we've learned. Um, you'll, you'll hear a Cornell notes. Cornell notes, um, you, you oftentimes verbalize the summary of, of material. Verbalization may also help anchor the skills and strategies both behaviorally but also mathematically. And it can also summarize what, why, and how we're learning it. Um, you'll hear me oftentimes say in my classroom, what are we learning? Why are we learning this? And how are we going to get the answer to this problem? So those are some of the things that you'll oftentimes hear me say in my classroom. All right, so after going over substitution and elimination, summarize for me what elimination and substitution means to you in words. Well, substitution and elimination allows us to find the x and y coordinate, which, um, which is the point of which the two equations cross. Very good. Very good summarization. Step four in the process of the research-based um, steps to being able to help a learning disability math student is to visually represent information in the math problem. Um, visually representations can be drawings, graphic, represent, gra graphic representations that have been used intuitively by teachers to explain and clarify problems and by students to understand the simplify, to simplify problems. Students like to see and feel things. That's why visual representations are oftentimes useful. They get to see or feel the action, and it may be something they can relate with in the real world. Okay, we're going to be learning about combining like terms today. And my guest Aaron up here is going to help me out. So right now we have an equation 4x plus 3 plus 2x. The way that I'm going to teach Aaron today is by visually representing information. So we're going to have a blue marker and a green marker and we're going to put, put this all together. So we're going to highlight our four x's, we're going to put them in blue, and we're going to have them be the same shape as our x's. So Aaron, does this x represent a good picture of what four x's might look like? Yes. All right. And then we're going to add it with three <coughs> constants. So our constants, Aaron, we're just going to put as a shape as dots, or well, maybe we'll call them cookies today. How's that sound? Cookies. All right. So, are our x's different from our dots? Yes. Yes, just like in our problem, right? Do you agree? Yes. All right. And then we got to add two more x's. So what color should our two x's be at the end? Blue. It should be blue x's. Very good. What do we think, Aaron? Good representation of what this equation looks like? Yes. All right. So now what I want you to do for me, Aaron, is I want you to tell me how many blue x's do we have total? 
They have six blue axes. Can I add these X's with my dots? No, you can't. Why not? Because they're okay, the chairs. different shapes. You can't add the shape Good. And in this lesson, we're going to learn that these different shapes, we can't add those together because we're going to say they we're not, they're not like terms. Okay? So like you said, they're not the same shape. But when we look at these equations, we're going to say they're not like terms. Okay? So you're absolutely right. If we add these four x's and the two blue x's together, we can add those together because they're the same shape. So we would have six x's. <coughs> How about dots? Do we have any other dots we can add together? No. No. So we're just going to add, we're going to say six x's plus our three dots. And that's all we can do because are they two separate shapes? Yes, so that's when we know we're done, is when we're left with one, one shape. So we would say that 4x plus 3 plus 2x can equal 6x plus 3 if we're doing our equation. Did we learn something today? Yes. All right. Step 5 in the research-based practices for helping um, students with math learning disabilities would be to teach students to solve problems. Um, the approach that I use in my classroom for problem solving um, is to use a, an approach where they read the problem, they read the whole story problem, and then they go and highlight the key information. This is a big idea. It'll, oftentimes you'll see uh, some of our students, they'll vary on what, what's important and what's not important in the story problem. So we spend a lot of time highlighting the key information in the words. That way we can, we can show the kids what the big parts of the story problem are and what parts are not important. Um, this is oftentimes the hardest part of story problems for kids is determining what's the important information and what's not the important information. We teach how to solve the problem and then we check our work based off of the story problem's ideas. This approach breaks the problem down and is a systematic approach that makes it more organized to understand what is being asked. Again, in real life story problems, I always like to relate to real life scenarios in my math class because a lot of times my students ask, why are we doing this? Are we ever going to use this? And uh, in these areas, I can explain how we're going to use it and why we use it. And it also, some kids find it interesting because they're like, wow, we're actually going to use this material. So step five in the, in the process. I have my great student, Taylor, here. And we're going to read a story problem together. And, Taylor, and Taylor's going to highlight the key information and then she's going to tell us why she highlighted that information. A farmer's total payment for tools and compost over the course of two years is $23,894. Write an equation to find the payment for the second year if the first year's payment is 11205 So Tay, why don't you highlight the important information? I highlighted this because these are both parts of the equation we are trying to find. Very good. Okay. So one one more thing, Tay, that we might want to add in is we want we might want to find the payment for the second year. Mm -hmm. That might be some important information because if we don't know what we're trying to find for the second year, we probably want to put a variable in, don't we? So the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to write the equation. So we're going to hi we highlighted the important pieces, and now we're going to put them into our equation. So Taylor would put this in our equation by putting the first year's payment, adding it to our variable because we don't know what the second year's payment is, and putting it to the total, which was twenty three thousand eight hundred and ninety four. So what we did there is we broke down the problem, we highlighted the key points, and then we were able to create an equation off of that. Good job, Tay. <laughs> Step six of our research-based practices that help students with math learning disabilities is using formative assessment data. There are a lot of different ways using formative assessment data. It's kind of whichever way is more comfortable for you. One of the common ways that I use formative assessment data is through whiteboards. Uh, I have the kids do, to do math problems or story problems for that matter. And uh, once they're done answering the question, they'll hold the whiteboard up. This just gives me a good idea of what students know it, 
what specific students maybe are struggling with, because I can see the area that they're struggling with exactly. And then I can also tell what students are completely lost, which tells me I need to spend more time with that specific student. So formative assessment helps teachers measure the rhythm of the student's growth or struggles, and also helps them fine tune the student's direct needs. Providing teachers with information regarding their student's progress in math, it's beneficial because of the effects on the mathematics performance of the same students. This is Zach and Caitlin. They're my special guests today. They're showing how we use for, um, formative, formative assessment in our classroom. One of the ways that we use formative assessment in my classroom is through whiteboards. Um, you can see Zach and Caitlin both solved an equation. They were solving for x. Um, this is a good time for me after they're done solving is to give them immediate feedback. I think that's the big purpose of formative assessment. So right now, if we were in our class right now, I would tell Zach and be able to give feedback to Zach how he needed to add the opposite. Um, instead of doing minus 6, he would have to add 6, right, Zach? Yeah. So I could give Zach some feedback on that, and uh, then he would know how to, and he wouldn't make the same mistake most likely again because Mr. Hewitt would give him a, the exact feedback at that exact time, right? Yeah. And Caitlin over here, she made a simple, she did the process completely right. She added the opposite. She did the opposite of negative 6, which was positive 6, which is, which is great. Um, and then she added 12 and 6 and got 17, which I would then be able to go over to Caitlin and show her that 12 plus 6 is 18. And when we divide by 3, we get 6. So I want to thank my special guests, Zach and Caitlin. We use this quite a bit, don't we, guys? Mm -hmm. Do you guys like it? Yeah. What do you guys like most about it? I like most about it is the quick response you can give and how I feel like I'm getting the one I want to help I need. And just all around, I feel like it's an effective strategy for me. Step 7 of the research-based data to help students with learning disabilities, this is the last step. Um, is to provide peer-assisted instruction to the students. A lot of times I'll have our, or have my class um, either get in partners or in groups. I feel like this really, this really helps. They help, they help each other, and sometimes it's nice, you know, I'd say 99% of the time as teachers, we're constantly the ones teaching the students. Sometimes the students enjoy teaching themselves. Um, so there can be huge dividends with this. Students can learn from their peers because they may relate to them at a higher level than the teacher on, a cer on certain areas. Um, students may feel more comfortable or in tune because they are held responsible for how they are teaching another student. And lastly, the student teaching the struggling student feels a sense of accomplishment. They, you know, a lot of students who have math learning disability, oftentimes they, you'll hear them say, well, I'm going to fail anyway. They, feel, they don't feel success. So when they know something, they, you see them in, in my class specifically, they get a little bit excited um, when they know, when they're on to a certain topic and they really understand something. So putting them with a partner who doesn't understand, they feel a, a self-accomplishment, they feel a reward by teaching that other student. Apparently, I think you did this wrong. You're supposed to combine like um, 1x plus x. You're right, thank you, Aaron. Sometimes as we're here, puts us together to work in groups so we can teach each other this real process. The last part of my presentation is uh, I'm going to go through how this affects the students, students with math, math learning disabilities, how it affects them cognitively. We've already kind of expressed that a little bit, but we'll do a little bit of a review in that area. But we're also, we'll also talk about how it affects them socially and emotionally. Um, cognitively speaking, again, we've touched a lot of these points, but these are, these are the students that have trouble or delays with their cognitive development in math. Um, this hinders the way they think and process information regarding math problems. Um, students with math, a math learning disability have problems in understanding relationships between numbers, solving word problems, understanding number systems, and using effective counting strategies. At this particular time, there are a few scientifically validated treatment programs to address mathematical cogn cognitive deficits of students, but that's where teachers get in. You know, I think it's our job as teachers to help these students and make these students feel comfortable and make math a fun learning environment. 
So there's nothing scientifically we can do, but that's why the teachers get to pay the big bucks in a sense. This is why we rely on intervention methods and great special education teachers um, can't reflect on that any higher. You know, education teacher, as special education teachers, we do make a difference to these kids, kids' lives. How can we help these kids with uh, math learning disabilities? How can we help them in the area of emotionally help them and also socially help them? You have to remember that a lot of these kids have been considered failures their whole life. Math has not came, come easy to them, so they, they have a sense of socially that they do not fit in to, to peers of their same age. So they do go through issues socially, also emotionally, it can have a huge effect on them. Students with learning disabilities ex experience emotional distress related to their difficulties. Students with learning disabilities tend to have higher le levels of emotional concerns. They oftentimes have depression, states of depression at least. They feel lonely, they feel like they don't belong, they have low self-esteem, and they oftentimes have higher anxiety levels. Socially speaking, students who repeatedly struggle in math classes can lead to the student assuming they're failures. Low success in classes can lead to low self-esteem, which can lead to the student's willingness to participate in school activities. The last area that I wanted to talk about, um, specifically with students who have math learning disabilities, but mostly in general, any kid that has a math learning disability, um, they do have struggles in an area. So I think it's our job as teachers to, first and foremost, cr create relationships um, with these students. I feel like students in my classroom want to learn and are eager to learn, which that might be the first time that has ever they've ever felt like that, and it's because I try, I try my best to create relationships with the students. I try, to, try my best to make them feel comfortable in the classroom. I try to make math a fun learning environment where they don't feel scared to ask a question. They don't feel scared. They don't hide the fact that they struggle with math or have a math learning disability. I think we can accomplish a great deal by creating relationships with our students. Um, it allows them to feel comfortable, like I said. They feel like they're not a failure, and they feel like they're comfortable to come up and ask you a question. And uh, we need to give these kids who have math learning disabilities some confidence. Um, I've seen some kids who started out really low in math, and with a little bit of confidence, they, they did great things, and they, we eventually put them into general, the general education classroom because they felt so comfortable. Um, so I think first and foremost that creating relationships with students is probably the most important area that we can work on or become better with with our students. In summary, after watching my presentation, here were some of the things that I wanted you to take away from my presentation. The first thing is I think after watching my presentation you should be able to describe what a learning disability in math is and what which individuals it applies to. Second, I think you should provide intervention methods. We talked about seven. Obviously there's a lot of intervention methods, research-based interventions that you can use. I listed seven for you that work best for my personality and teaching style, but those will help the students through their frustrations in math. Third, I think you should be able to explain um, how a learning disability cognitively uh, affects the student. Fourth, fourth, understand the deeper issues of social and emotional effect that it may have on a student with a learning disability in math. And lastly, um, how does a student, a general ed student in math, get put into a resource-based classroom um, through resource or uh, through response to intervention methods and the tiers that we talked about in the presentation? The last thing that I'm going to leave you with in my presentation is uh, some of my students that I have in my classroom expressing some of the things that they like about me as a teacher. This is not this is not to boost my ego at all, um, but rather it's, it's more for you guys to see that some of my intervention methods that we talked about today um, affects them and how it affects their learning, but how, how, also how it affects them socially and emotionally. So I'll leave those videos with you and uh, have a great day. I like the way how Mr. Hewitt breaks down everything step by step for me. He doesn't get frustrated if I ask it a couple times. I like how Mr. Hewitt teaches us shortcuts and 
ways that I understand, it's magical. I like how Mr. Hewer took his time to get to know me, and that's why I'm comfortable in that class. Mr. Hewer is a good teacher because he writes down the samples on the board that helps us, like, when we get out of high school and on real life situations and problems like that. I like Mr. Hewer because he's always here for me to support. Um, I've, I'm frustrated sometimes, and he just helps me get through it. I like Mr. Hewer's teaching because it's simple and easy, it's easy to understand, and the steps are easy to follow because they're straight to the point. All right, so one thing I like about Mr. Hewer is the fact that he is willing to get to know me on a personal level. I don't like math. I don't understand it very well. It's definitely not my favorite subject. Yet, in Mr. Hubert's classroom, I feel like he's trying to understand where I'm coming from, where, where that disconnect is. And I really appreciate the fact that he tries to understand and he makes it fun so that I want to continue trying to learn and try to understand. I feel like Mr. Hubert as a teacher is very down to earth. And when I say down to earth, I don't mean he's like a hippie or anything like that. I mean like he's very relatable and I can talk to him on a personal level with my problems, my questions. And when I can relate to a teacher, I feel like learning in general becomes much easier to me. When I am around Mr. Hewer, he makes me feel really relaxed when I am stressed out and stuff. And that makes me want to learn math a lot more.